So good morning. This is Chair Rita Moran, pursuit of House Rule 10.01. I call this remote meeting of the House Ways and Means Committee to order. So here we are in a new year. Uh, happy New Year's to everyone. Happy 2021. Uh, again, uh, I just want to uh, share a little bit with you about my personal journey um, uh, on my way to being the chair of Ways and Means. But as many of you know, I am in my sixth term in the Minnesota House of Representatives, uh, representing District 65A in St. Paul. Um, it has been one the the, the the best honors that I could have had to uh, represent the district in my community. Um, it has truly been an opportunity for me to bring the voices of my district, which is a very diverse district into the body. Um, I've had an opportunity to share the Health and Human Service Ways Committee. And yes, that too have definitely been an honor for me. Um, because it is a huge committee, um, but it is a committee that really impacts people's everyday lives. And so here I am um, today leading as the Chair of Ways and Means Committee. And I hope to be able to operate in the same type of way that I operated in as Chair of Health and Human Service, which is really in partnership with, right? And leading in a way that we are able to do really good work for Minnesotans across the state. And that is really, really important today in 2021 when 2020 has been so heavy for so many of us from a pandemic, from you know a civic unrest to, um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's been pretty heavy. And so my hope is that even as 2021 seems to have gotten off to be a little rocky, that we can find some hope and some joy and some possibilities in 2021. I believe we can do that. I believe that we all came to this table. We all came to this work. We're all here as legislators to do the most good for Minnesotans across the state of Minnesota. And so that would be my expectation as the chair of Ways and Means is that we can find those possibilities in 2021 to move our state forward 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 and so you know i hope that you know we can be as bipartisan as possible you know recognizing that we are the only divided legislature in the country the only one so the goal is to be bipartisan with, with where, wherever possible but my hope is that in saying that that we can be respectful at all times I ask that we not just hear one another in this committee, but that we are actively listening to one another. The more that we can understand each other's values and find common ground in what we hope to accomplish this session, the easier it would be for us to collaborate. And so that is a goal of mine that we are able to collaborate. Not just me collaborating with the Senate Republicans, but with the House Republicans. I want you to, uh, to all take the time to communicate and work with one another outside of these hearings as well. Um, continue to show as we did in the last biennial that while we remain a divided government that we are united in our goals to improve the lives of Minnesotans and do the people's work by producing a budget. That is our goal is to produce a balanced budget. So some of my expectations of what a state budget should look like. So a budget is, our, is first and foremost a moral document that makes clear what we believe the priorities of our state must be. A budget is first and foremost a moral document that makes clear what we believe the priorities of our state must be and the role our government should play in realizing those goals. 
We must develop a budget that advances the goal of equity, further reducing disparities rather than whiten them. It is, you know, I, I, I really do not want us to go another budget session where we are highlighting the disparities within the state of Minnesota. We are bigger than these, these disparities. And so my hope is that, um, especially in a time of crisis like the current pandemic, that we are focusing on how to work to reduce the disparities in the state of Minnesota. And we must continue to reimagine. I want us to reimagine how we provide services, investing more in the programs that treat the underlying causes of problem facing Minnesota, rather than always chasing after the symptoms. We are a body that do a lot of chasing of symptoms and instead of trying to find the underlying causes um, of the problem. And I will go into my little story I told before, and I think I will, about what I mean by that. So I'm going to share a little story with you, really short. And so this is a story. And for my members who was on Health and Human Service, you heard the story before, but I think it's worth sharing again at this moment. And so there was a group of young people who was walking through the forest, just taking a stroll through the forest. It was a beautiful day. And they came upon a river. And as they looked over into the river, they noticed something that was in the river. And as they went closer, they noticed that there was babies in the river. And immediately they ran to the river and they began to just scoop the babies out the river one by one by one. They began to save the babies who were about to drown in the river. And as hard as they were to grab the babies out of the river, the more babies continued to flow down. And eventually one of the the young ladies who was walking in the forest ran away. She just started running away. And the others, you know, yell out to her, say, hey, where are you going? Where are you going? And she yelled back and she said, I am going upstream because I need to find out why the babies continue to come down the stream. And so, that is going, that is what I mean about reimagining how we provide services and investing more in programs that treat the underlying causes of the problem facing Minnesotans rather than always chasing after the symptoms. And I believe that we can be that we can do this this legislative session where we have a budget in front of us. So before we get to our presentation from MMB, I would like to take some time in this first hearing for members and staff to introduce themselves. I would like to start with staff. So I call your name and I have you briefly tell us your role on the committee, how long you have been with the house and how long you've been serving on the Ways and Means Committee, all right? So let's start with our nonpartisan staff with Bill Marks. Good morning. Uh, Bill Marks, uh, fiscal staff, the chief fiscal analyst. Uh, I'm the one who keeps track of the numbers, I guess. And uh, I've worked with the Ways and Means Committee since 1997, and I've been with the House uh, since a bit longer than that. All right. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, uh, Bill. Uh, why don't we go on to Colby Sullivan? Good morning, Madam Chair and members. I'm Colby Sullivan with the nonpartisan House Research Department. I've been with House Research for a total of 15 years and staffing the Ways and Means Committee for eight. Oh, great. Okay, now let's introduce our partisan staff. Let's start with, uh, start with Harry Kennedy. Morning, Madam Chair and members. Uh, my name is Harry Kennedy. I have been, uh, I'm the GOP uh, caucus researcher, and I've been with the House since 2011 and have staffed the Ways and Means Committee uh -huh. for six years. Thank you. Thank you, Harry. Uh, Dave Sullivan. Uh, hello, I'm David Sullivan 
with uh, House DFL research. And I might be second in seniority to Bill Marks here. I've been with the House since 2007 and have been with the Ways and Means Committee that entire time. So 14 years with Ways and Means. Awesome. And Laura Sparkman. Good morning. I'm Laura Sparkman. I'm the Committee Legislative Assistant. I've worked um, for the House since January of 2019, and I've served with the Ways and, Me Ways and Means Committee since April of 2019. Okay. Uh, and last but not least, Chris McCall. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Chris McCall, I'll be the committee administrator uh, this session. This is my 10th session at the legislature, my third with the House, um, and first with Ways and Means, but I've been uh, working alongside Chair Moran for three years now as a committee administrator um, in helping human services policy last session, as well as uh, long-term care with Chair Schultz. And uh, Madam Chair, I also neglected to include Margaret Martin from the new Republican House Caucus, uh, who is on the call as well. Okay. What is their name again, Chris? Uh, Margaret Martin. Margaret Martin. Margaret Martin. Margaret Martin. Martin. Uh, could you please yes. go ahead, Margaret? Yeah, I staff uh, Representative Miller. I work for the new House Republican Caucus. I've been with them since uh, they were formed last uh, session. And I also worked at the House um, in 2010, 20, uh, to 2013. Um, that's it. All right, thank you. Awesome. So now I'd like to have our members introduce themselves. As you know, this is a very large committee. We have 29 members on this committee. And since we do not have a physical table to go around, um, we wanna make sure that we can actually get to Commissioner Showwaters and his team today. So I'm going to ask Ms. Sparkman to call the roll. When you hear your name, please introduce yourself with your name, your district, and also let us know if you will be serving as a chair or ranking member of any finance committee this session. I will also like uh, to uh, invite our ranking members to provide a brief opening remarks when uh, their names are called, if they choose to. And so our ranking members will be uh, Representative Pat Garofalo uh, from the Republican Caucus and also Tim Miller from the new GOP. So um, Ms. Sparkman, if you could please call the roll, but let's start with Garofalo. And then let's give um, Representative Miller an opportunity and then do the rest of the, the, the members, if you would. Um, Representative Garofalo. Uh, good morning, uh, Pat Garofalo, House District 58B, um, serving in my, gosh, what term is it? My ninth term now, geez. Uh, so uh, Madam Chair, thank you for the introduction. Appreciate it, uh, obviously. Ways and Means Committee has a wide jurisdiction, lots of subject matters for uh, us to hear from. So I look forward to hearing from our testifiers today and from, as always, learning a lot from the expert testimony that will be for us. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Representative Miller. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Tim Miller from District 17A. And I look forward to working on this committee and learning. This is my first time on Ways and Means, and I certainly have a lot to learn about its process. Um, I really think our main job this session is going to be to lower intentions and rebuilding the trust of government. And as Chair Moran said, our work, um, our budget reflects our priorities, and our work must not divide but unite. I trust in transparency and the hard work of each member here. I look forward to it. God bless all of you and, and God bless uh, Minnesota. Thank you. Vice Chair Olson. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Liz Olson, District 7B. I'm in my third term in office and this is my second term as the Vice Chair of Ways and Means. Representative Albright. Good morning, uh, Representative Albright. I uh, serve uh, the good folks of uh, House District 55B. Uh, I'm the ranking member on uh, the uh, Human Services, uh, Finance, and Policy. Uh, and I've served on Ways and Means uh, for the last six years. 
Representative Becker Finn. Uh, Jamie Becker Finn. I represent District 42B, which is Ramsey County suburbs. I am in my third term and the am the incoming chair of the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee. And this is my first time on Ways and Means. Representative Bernardi. Thank you. I re Representative Condi Bernardi. I represent the communities of New Brighton, Fridley, and Spring Lake Park, District 51A. I serve as the higher education chair, and I will be starting my second year on this Ways and Means Committee and my eighth term in the Minnesota legislature. Thanks. Representative Eklund. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm, I'm Rob Eklund. I represent District 3A. Uh, I can't name my, all, all my cities, but I'll call name my counties, Coochishing Lake, Cook, and most and Northeast St. Louis County. I chair the Labor and Industry Veterans Finance and Policy Committee, and this is my fourth term and my second term on Ways and Means. Representative Hansen. Good morning, uh, Rick Hansen. I represent Northern Dakota County. I'm chair of the Environment, Finance, and Natural Resources Committee, and I've been on Ways and Means for three years. Representative Hassan. Good morning, everyone. Hoden Hassan. I am a second term. This is my second term and first time serving uh, Ways and Means. I uh, represent uh, South Minneapolis. Thank you. Representative Hertoss. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, members. I'm uh, Jerry Hertoss. I represent District 33A. 33A is in Western Hennepin County, comprising 11 cities, approximately 35 to 40% of Hennepin County geographically. I'm serving my fifth term, second term on Ways and Means, and I'm the Republican lead on the Property Tax Committee. Representative Hornstein. Uh, good morning, everybody. Frank Hornstein. I represent District 61A, which includes parts of downtown and southwest Minneapolis. I chair the Transportation Finance and Policy Committee. I'm entering my 10th term in the Minnesota House, and this is my uh, third term on the uh, Ways and Means Committee. Representative Johnson. Uh, good morning, I'm Representative Brian Johnson from uh, 32A, which is most of Isani County, Northern Chisago County. I'm on my fifth term and the current ranking member of uh, public safety. Representative Kresha. Good morning, Representative Ron Kresha. I serve uh, District 9B, which is Morrison and Todd County. Um, on the GOP side for education finance, second term on Ways and Means. Representative Liebling. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members. I'm Tina Liebling. I am a classmate of Representative Garofalo and a couple other members in this committee. I think it's term nine. And um, I'm this term, I'm chairing the Health, Finance, and Policy Committee. And I think I've, I've lost count, but it might be my third time on Ways and Means. Representative Lilly. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I uh, represent uh, uh, three East Metro communities, North St. Paul, Maple, and Oakdale. Uh, I'm uh, just starting my second term on this committee. Uh, I'm honored to chair the uh, legacy uh, committee this uh, session and uh, I'm looking forward to our good work on this committee uh, for the state of Minnesota. Representative Mariani and Representative Marquardt are excused today so we'll go on to Representative Nash. Good morning members Madam Chair thank you my name is Jim Nash I represent District 47A which is uh, Western Carver County. I am entering my fourth term here in the Minnesota House, and this is my first term uh, on Ways and Means, and I will be the ranking member on state government finance. Representative Nelson. Good 
I am Representative uh, Michael Nelson. I the chair of the State Government Finance Policy and Elections Committee. And uh, I think this is my this is my tenth term. Uh, I was elected with Representative Hornstein, and uh, I think this is my second time on Ways and Means. Representative Noor. Good morning, um, Madam Chair, uh, Representative Mahmoud Noor. I represent District 60B uh, in Minneapolis. That's the neighborhood surrounding the University of Minnesota. Uh, this is my second term and also second term on Ways and Means. And I also chair workforce uh, and business development. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Mary and O'Neill. I serve 29B, which is Buffalo, Monticello, Maple Lake. I'm starting my fifth term. This is my first time on Ways and Means, and I'm the ranking minority member for higher education. Representative Pulowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just a retired social studies teacher from Monona. Thank you. Representative Petersburg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I'm in my fifth term. I represent 24A down in Oatano Azica, and I'm the Republican lead on transportation, finance, and policy. Representative Pinto. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dave Pinto representing the southwest part of St. Paul, Highland Park, Mac Groveland area. I'm the chair of the Early Childhood Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, so all things a uh, little kid. And uh, I am um, in my fourth term, and this is my first term on Ways and Means. Thanks. Representative Schumacher. I believe he's not on the call. Uh, Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Jen Schultz. I represent District 7A, which is East Duluth. I'm in my fourth term, and I have the honor of serving as chair of the Human Services Finance and Policy Committee. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, hello, everybody. I am Representative Peggy Scott. I represent the cities of Andover, Northern Coon Rapids, and a little bit of the city of Ramsey. I'm in my seventh term. This is my second um, term. My second term on um, Ways and Means, and I'm the lead on the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. Representative Sundin. Good morning, Madam Chair and Committee. Mike Sundin is from. District 11A, which encompasses Carleton County. I'm uh, chair of the Ag Committee this year. This is my first time on Ways and Means, so uh, please be uh, uh, tolerant and uh, kind, I guess, to me. Uh, like I say, I get my mail in uh, Esco, Minnesota, but I believe I live on Highway I-35. I believe that concludes our introductions. All right, fantastic. Well, with that, um, thank you members. And I would note for the record that we do have a quorum. And so it seems like, you know, this is a great opportunity. There are so, I hear a lot of first and second termers on ways and means, which in my mind, give us an opportunity to really reimagine what our budget needs to be to lift up uh, Minnesotans. And so um, as we wait for our committees to begin their work and start sending us legislation, I want to use these early hearings to help set the table as we prepare to assemble our next state budget. With COVID-19 pandemic and a new administration arriving to the White House next week, there's even more uncertainty than usual around what our state finances will look like as we wait for the February forecast to arrive six weeks from now. So in the meantime, I want us to focus on what we do know. So to, dis to start that discussion, I have invited Commissioner Showwaters from MMB to provide us with an 
of, to provide us with an update about the status of our two main funding sources for addressing the pandemic. The federally funded coronavirus relief fund and the state-backed COVID-19 Minnesota fund. I have also asked him to give us an overview of the stimulus deal passed by Congress last month and how Minnesota may expect may expect to benefit from that legislation. Members, should you, you should have received an email from with the presentation from uh, Mr. McCall yesterday. And so that presentation is what we will view today and we'll have open discussion around. We do not have, it's, it's not too many slides. So I would ask that we allow the presenters to complete their presentation and then we'll open the floor for questions. So please take notes of your questions, write them down um, and so that you, know, you don't forget. Um, I know it's something that I have to do often is take notes. But with that, I'd like to welcome Commissioner Show Waters and his team to the committee. Commissioner, the floor is yours. Please introduce your, uh, yourself and then proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Madam Chair members, for the record, my name is Jim Showalter, Commissioner of Minnesota Management and Budget. And I'll give you just a quick intro um, and uh, introduce our team and uh, we will give you that presentation. I just wanna thank you, uh, Madam Chair and members, uh, on as you're setting up uh, for this new legislative session. Uh, I recognize many of you, but I know that to many others, uh, I am a, a, a new face. And I just wanna give you a quick background in your, in, in your phrasing, Jim Showalter, it's my second term. Um, this is my second time as a Commissioner of Management and Budget. Uh, I'm honored uh, to be asked uh, to take this role by Governor Waltz. Uh, previously, I served in the first term uh, for Governor Dayton. Um, uh, some of you also may know that I was uh, as State Budget Director in the previous administration for Governor Pawlenty. Um, through that, I really have a lot of respect for the work that Ways and Means does because it's really foundational. Uh, and it's a key partner for MMB because we try to get you information. We try to help you think long-term and we try to help you understand those results and why things are happening. So uh, Madam Chair, uh, the, the question of why uh, is this happening is, is exactly right. And, and it's, I think part of that kind of conversation that is not, uh, is always tested by information, understanding, putting together frameworks. And I think the MMB team is uniquely suited and uh, uh, is part of our role um, to help have that dialogue and have that information. Um, I should note uh, that uh, the, the topic for today, COVID is really important and is really critical and an appropriate starting point. Part of my experience was working on the Recovery Act uh, more, more than a decade ago. And, and, and what was curious about that as I came back was that I quickly realized that the duration of COVID-19 really stretches our expectations and understanding of how we respond to an emergency situation. And that the twists and turns, the constant changes of this situation make keeping information available very important, understanding those changes and, and that our initial preconceptions of how it's gonna work rarely have met um, what has actually happened on the ground. And so I appreciate the opportunity for our team to brief you and uh, work through this together. Um, to lead that discussion, um, I'm gonna introduce Britta Raytan, our state budget director. Uh, Britta has a, a wealth of experience in budgeting and um, has been really point person on uh, working through these federal fund issues uh, over the last uh, number of months. Um, Britta, could you introduce yourself? Certainly, um, thank you so much, Jim. Um, it looks like uh, they're pulling up our PowerPoint right now, which is which is helpful. Again, uh, my name is Britta Rayton. I am the State Budget Director at MNB. Um, I've been in this role for um, about two and a half years at this point, but I've been with MNB for 15 years. Um, and uh, to Commissioner Showalter's point, I also was very involved in, in working on the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. So um, there is a lot about this that is familiar, but a, a, a quite a bit that is very different as well. So we will walk through uh, today an overview of um, the funding sources for the response to COVID-19. 
I also have with me um, a number of members of our team at MMB. This has been um, a, a really significant effort at MMB to um, respond, um, to, to, to monitor and, and uh, coordinate the, the fiscal response to COVID-19. So I have Marianne Conboy. She's an executive budget officer at MMB who has really been running point on the COVID Minnesota Fund. And then Melissa Lamb Young, also an executive budget officer at MMB that has been um, doing the day-to-day -day, um, management and monitoring of the Coronavirus Relief Fund. And then also um, on, on the meeting today is Amy Jorgensen, who has been leading our um, COVID response and accountability office. Um, so all three of them will have a, a piece of this presentation. Um, and, and again, um, we're, we're open to questions. I'm happy to be helpful in, in whatever way possible. So with that, we will um, jump into the, to the meat of the presentation, if you could advance the slide. So this first slide just provides an overview of the funding resources to combat COVID-19. The purple boxes really summarize the state response. Um, the COVID Minnesota Fund was seeded with 200 million in general fund dollars um, during the March uh, session, or during the, the last regular session, but during the March legislation of that session. Um, and then there was additional targeted state appropriations um, back in March, and then we added to those state appropriations as you're well aware with the December special session. Additionally, the Coronavirus Relief Fund, that's in the blue section, that's really focused on the federal funding. The Coronavirus Relief Fund um, provided uh, significant resources for state response. In total, the state of Minnesota received $2.187 billion in federal coronavirus relief funds. 317 million of that went directly to Ramsey and Hennepin County, with another 841 million uh, allocated through the state out to other local units of government. Um, also within that bill, there was specific programmatic funding streams outside of the coronavirus relief funds that totaled over a billion dollars for the state of Minnesota. So that was all part of the CARES Act that passed back in March. And uh, we will get at the end of the presentation into a, a high level discussion of the new federal coronavirus relief bill that passed in December. And then um, in addition to the, the federal supports coming through the CARES Act and the most recent December uh, legislation, we are also um, pursuing FEMA funds where possible. Um, and Amy Jorgensen will give an overview of the, our FEMA funding request to date um, at the end of the presentation as well. And then as you know, as part of these federal funding packages, there's also been direct payments and loans to individuals and businesses that don't flow through the state. So those don't show up in, on our um, state tracking of resources or our fund statements, but they are certainly helping um, the people and businesses of Minnesota. If you could turn to the next slide. So this slide just takes a look at the state resources for COVID response. Um, as I mentioned on the previous slide, the top line shows the COVID-19 Minnesota Fund. That was seeded with $200 million of state general fund uh, resources. Uh, there's also, also the Healthcare Response Fund. This fund was established to provide um, resources to providers um, and was granted out by the Department of Health. There's an additional 50 million for uh, providers in the public health contingency account as well. So 50 million of that 76 million you see reflected there is also um, granted out to healthcare providers for their COVID response. Um, and then there's a listing of additional general fund direct appropriations. Many of these um, were, were put in place uh, back in March um, as we were just um, beginning our state response to the pandemic. But then towards the bottom of the list, you can also see um, the small business assistance grants to large venues, the county relief grants to small businesses and the unemployment insurance contingent appropriation all of those state resources were part of the December special session action um, to continue the, the state support for the COVID response. In total, um, across all of these resources, there's 796 million that has been allocated from state resources to respond to the pandemic. If you turn to the next slide. This slide just provides an overview of the COVID-19 Minnesota Fund. Um, again, the initial balance in that fund was 200 million. Um, 
The total authorizations to date, though, are, are above that at 223.7 uh, million. Uh, Marianne Comboy will walk through this in more detail, but what's, what's important to note is that we have received reimbursements back into this COVID-19 Minnesota fund, um, primarily from FEMA um, and from insurance. And so the FEMA reimbursement was a, a FEMA reimbursement to pay 75% um, of the cost for a storage building that was purchased back in the spring. The insurance reimbursements have been um, insurance reimbursements paid on our testing contract that was funded from the COVID Minnesota Fund. This, this was a $36 million testing contract that was authorized back in the spring with the U of M and Mayo. And they have subsequently collected insurance reimbursements on that testing and restored those dollars to the fund. And then below that is an overview of the Federal Coronavirus Relief Fund. Um, it, it provides the initial balance of um, $2.192 billion um, with total um, authorizations exceeding that, there have been insurance reimbursements coming into this fund as well as, um, as interest earnings earned on this fund. Um, but I will pass this um, to now to uh, Marianne Conboy to provide more detail on the COVID-19 Minnesota fund if you'll turn to the next slide. Marianne? Madam Chair uh, and members of the committee, my name is Marianne Conboy, and I'm an Executive Budget Officer at MMB. I will provide additional detail about the COVID-19 Minnesota Fund, which is shown on this slide. The fund was established in March 2020 with $200 million from the General Fund. This fund provides a flexible pot of money for expenditures associated with the COVID-19 pandemic. Expenditure requests in excess of $1 million have an approval process through the Legislative COVID-19 Response Commission, the LCRC. Funds that were not authorized by December 31st, 2020, cancel to the general fund. You'll notice that more than 200 million is authorized in the fund. And this is because of cancellations and reimbursements like Britta mentioned. Um, some authorizations have canceled unspent balances, which were then reauthorized for another purpose in the fund. In addition, the fund has started receiving reimbursements, 4.1 million in FEMA reimbursements for the storage facility and 19.5 million from testing insurance reimbursements. And we expect that more reimbursements will be added. As you can see, various authorizations have been made for COVID response work groups, including critical care supplies, testing, food security, at-risk populations, and hospital surge capacity and additional authorizations have been made for state government operations and other non-work groups. And I'll turn it over to Melissa Lamb-Young to speak to the CRF. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, my name is Melissa Lamb-Young and I'm an executive budget officer at MMB. I'll be providing additional detail about the Federal Coronavirus Relief Fund. On March 27th, 2020, the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or the CARES Act, was enacted. The CARES Act established the $150 billion Coronavirus Relief Fund in response to the COVID-19 public health emergency. As previously mentioned, of the $150 billion, Minnesota was allocated $2.187 billion, with $317 million being directly paid from the U.S. Treasury to Hennepin and Ramsey counties. The remaining $1.87 billion was deposited into the state treasury in April 2020. The CARES Act requires that the funds only be used to cover expenses that are necessary expenditures incurred due to the public health emergency were not accounted for in the budget most recently approved as of March 27th of last year and were incurred during the period that begins March 1st, 2020 and now ends on December 31st, 2021. Originally, costs had to be incurred by December 30th, 2020, but the recently enacted federal COVID relief bill extended the availability of the fund through the end of this year. The expenditure review process for the CRF has generally followed the interim procedures for the 10-day Legislative Advisory Commission review outlined in Minnesota statute. This review and authorization process is generally used when the full legislature is not in session or if urgent items or emergencies arise. When in session, the full legislature may, of course, appropriate spending from the CRF. 
Similarly to the COVID-19 Minnesota fund, you'll notice that more than Minnesota's original allocation um, has been authorized in the fund. And this is because of cancellations. Some authorizations have canceled unspent balances, which were then reauthorized for another eligible purpose. Additionally, the fund has received just over $2 million in testing insurance reimbursements. As Amy Jorgensen will later describe in the presentation, we also anticipate FEMA reimbursements into the fund at a future date. Um, and as you can see, various authorizations have been made for COVID response work groups. So including those Ms. Conboy mentioned, there have been additional authorizations for economic security, education and childcare, community resiliency and recovery, and lastly, to local governments, um, which is also the largest component with 1.158 billion authorized. And with that, I will turn it back to Budget Director Raytan. Thank you, Melissa and Marianne. Um, what I did wanna talk about briefly, um, again, this is Britta Raytan, State Budget Director, is the fact that in December, um, we uh, provided a briefing to the LCRC members about the refinancing we were doing between COVID Minnesota Fund and the CRF. Um, at that point in time, we were still operating under the assumption because the federal bill had not yet been passed and signed that the coronavirus relief fund authorizations expired at the end of December of 2020. Um, and so leading up to that deadline, we uh, met with the LCRC and then submitted requests to the LAC in order to reduce coronavirus relief fund authorizations in, in places where um, spending would not occur before the end of December, and then redirect COVID Minnesota fund expenditures from the COVID Minnesota fund to the coronavirus relief fund to really make sure we were maximizing the available dollars in the coronavirus relief fund before we uh, reached that deadline. As uh, Melissa Lam Young noted, um, the, the final federal bill that was passed at the end of December and, and signed uh, very late in December by the president um, extended that deadline by a year. So now there is additional time to spend coronavirus relief funds. At the time of this refinancing, um, that legislation was, was not in place and, and not yet um, passed through Congress. So we moved about $45 million of expenditures from the COVID Minnesota Fund that were eligible uses of the Coronavirus Relief Fund over to the Coronavirus Relief Fund as part of that refinancing. In so doing, um, this freed up balance in the, in the COVID Minnesota Fund, and we subsequently um, submitted requests to the LCRC in advance of the end of December to obligate that balance for testing, vaccination, and for homelessness uh, support uh, through, the, through the winter months. With that, we can turn to the next slide. Um, I wanna highlight as part of this refinancing effort, we were really focused on moving those dollars to the Coronavirus Relief Fund where we didn't think we were gonna receive um, a FEMA dollar as reimbursement. And so we were really trying to maximize through this effort, the places where FEMA dollars were um, going to come back to the state that those FEMA reimbursements would hit the COVID Minnesota fund, which was again, seeded with general fund dollars, which would allow those reimbursements to then cancel back to the general fund. Um, so what we really uh, focused on in the dollars that we moved from the, uh, the COVID Minnesota fund to the CRF were those, were those places where if FEMA reimbursement was a possibility, we just moved the 25% share of the cost to the Coronavirus Relief Fund, holding the 75% share in the COVID Minnesota Fund so that if FEMA reimbursement was received, those dollars could cancel back to the COVID Minnesota Fund. In places where the original expenditure out of the COVID Minnesota Fund was not FEMA eligible, we then moved the 100% of the, of the expenditure to the CRF if, if, if it was in fact an eligible use of the CRF. And that was really how we targeted um, our refinancing to try to maximize uh, dollars returned to the state. If you'll turn to the next slide. 
Um, I want to quickly talk about the most recent federal bill uh, that passed in December. Um, we are still um, reviewing that bill, trying to fully understand um, the dollars that will be coming to the states. Uh, we work closely with uh, a group called FFIS, it's Federal Funds Information for the States that analyzes uh, federal legislation and provides um, information back to the states about how much uh, they anticipate that states will receive. So many of these numbers where a Minnesota allocation is shown from the total federal appropriation, uh, many of these numbers are provided by that um, FFIS organization that, that provides that analysis. Um, the top two lines are um, with what's referred to as GEAR and ESSER, and these are really the education funds um, for, for K-12 education, or E-12 education, I should say, um, coming to the state of Minnesota. Um, the first pot, it, we're anticipating about 19 million. The, the ESSER funds largely flow um, through, through the state, but directly to school districts, and that's about 588 million. There is significant resources for higher education, but at this point, we do not know how much um, exactly will flow to Minnesota institutions. So you can see on the chart that uh, there's a total appropriation at the federal level, but we do not have an allocation listed for uh, Minnesota institutions. There's a a uh, $7 billion pot of funds for broadband. Uh, what we are hearing at this point in time is that that $7 billion will not be allocated among states, but will be administered at the federal level. So we're not expecting to receive a state allocation, but certainly there will be some benefit to the state of the federal um, spending of those resources. Uh, the next line is rental assistance. Um, this rental assistance will flow to the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. They are expecting to receive about 375 million. I should say a portion of this will go directly to local governments um, in, in sizes over 200,000 of population. So there is some component of it that will flow directly to local governments with the remainder um, going to Minnesota Housing Finance Agency. Also through the CDC, um, there will be grants directly for vaccination and testing. Um, these dollars will flow through the Department of Health. Uh, we are ant anticipating at this point that the state of Minnesota will receive nearly 51 million for vaccination and 324 million for testing. Um, there's also a substance abuse prevention and treatment block grant where we're anticipating DHS will receive about 23.5 million and a mental health block grant with DHS receiving 25 million. Um, additionally, there was, a, there was a, an allocation for the CCDBG grant. Um, this will flow through DHS at about 137 million. Um, then there's a, a a grouping there of some smaller dollar amounts that I won't go into in detail. I'm gonna jump down to um, the urbanized area formula grants from the transit administration. Um, these dollars will largely uh, flow to the Met Council at 185 million. There's also rural area formula grants that will flow to um, the Department of Transportation at um, nearly uh, 14 points. 0.7 million, as well as airport, the airport improvement program, we're anticipating about 36 million to, to flow to the Department of Transportation. And then uh, the Federal Highway Administration, there's the Surface Transportation Block Grant. Um, again, that will go to MnDOT at 163.3 million. My understanding is that there's a formula allocation for then how it flows through to local units of government as well. And then that last line is representative of the unemployment insurance changes uh, that were also included in the, in the federal legislation. And with that, I will pass it to Amy Jorgensen, who's gonna speak to some of the details about receiving uh, these federal funds. Thank you, Britta. Uh, good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. For the record, my name is Amy Jorgensen. I'm the director of the COVID-19 Response Accountability Unit uh, at MMB. Uh, I'm just going to go over a couple of particulars on the Coronavirus Relief Fund and then also talk a little bit about FEMA. 
So as Director uh, Rattan talked about, um, recently enacted federal bill um, extended the time period for the use of the Coronavirus Relief Fund from December 30th, 2020 to December 31st of 2021. And as she mentioned, that was kind of a late breaking development, something that happened in the you know, waning days of, uh, of calendar year 2020. And so in response to that, then uh, we MMB did um, request uh, extended uh, spending authority for 28 previous LAC authorized uh, requests. Um, and so we have 28 now requests that will be authorized to be spent beyond December 30th of 2020 in varying dates. And then uh, also for those LAC authorizations ending December 30th, 2020, we will start working to identify and recapture any underspending um, and identify that and, um, and reallocate those, have the legislature reallocate those for other purposes. Just a little bit then about what it means when the um, time period was extended for the CRF. Um, previously, we had until October of 2021 to close out that source of funding with the federal government. Um, and now we're anticipating that, you know, the federal government will give us more time. And so we'll, there will be a final report of CRF fund expenditures due to Treasury uh, sometime in 2022. We don't have that exact time yet. Um, but the U.S. Treasury does give some time after the, uh, after the fund is expired to close out the fund. So next slide, please. What happens if there are disallowed costs? There are um, going to be any number of um, agencies kind of looking at how the state of Minnesota spent the coronavirus relief fund as well as the local governments that we gave money to. So uh, the US Treasury, we submitted a detailed report to them in December on our first uses of the coronavirus relief fund. So they'll be taking a look at that. And also the Minnesota Office of the State Auditor is going to be looking at the way that we use these funds at the state level. And then at the local government level, uh, the state auditor's office, as well as other CPA firms will be looking at the, you know, the way the funds were used in, in those um, venues. And the U.S. Treasury has offered some options. Um, they can, if there's a disallowed cost as a result of an audit, the U.S. Treasury can either seek recoupment of the funds or allow the entity to demonstrate that there are other eligible expenses that were incurred that would qualify for CRF. And so if there are any disallowed costs in the CRF, um, we'll go through that kind of discussion with Treasury around, you know, if we can, if we have to return the funds to the federal government or if we can um, use other eligible expenses. And Minnesota can appeal any determination of a disallowed cost. Next slide, please. All right, and then just briefly, I want to touch on FEMA. Uh, several people in the presentation have already talked about this. We, are, uh, we have many agencies that are requesting FEMA reimbursements for eligible expenses uh, as they are incurred. And so, so far to date, uh, the executive branch has submitted 30 projects to FEMA, uh, totaling about $30.5 million. Of this amount, we anticipate about 23 million will re be reimbursed. That's the 75% share that FEMA normally, um, normally gives us. And then uh, just as a testament to how quickly things sometimes change with FEMA, we put these slides together on Friday and then we had a few more uh, projects that were obligated uh, over the weekend. And so to date, FEMA has actually agreed to pay $9.5 million. Um, of the projects that we've requested. And has been stated before, we're continuing, uh, the agencies are continuing to identify costs that are FEMA reimbursable, and we will continue to work on FEMA reimbursements, I'm guessing throughout uh, calendar year 2021. And I believe that is the end of our slides. Uh, I'll turn it back to Budget Director Ritan for any other comments. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, with that, I think we can take questions um, if, you, if you have them. Thank you. Oh, Madam Chair, I think you're on mute. Thank you for that. <laughs> this is very tan. Um, I think I saw Representative, was it Peterson? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Uh, Madam Speaker. Uh, just in regards to the reallocation and the redistribution of funds that were either canceled or reimbursed back, um, I'm hoping that somebody from the agency can verify if that reauthorization was through LAC reauthorization or through uh, some other form of authorization, if they could, please. Mrs. Renton. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative, yes. Um, any, any reauthorization of the CRF was through the LAC process. So all of that was submitted to the LAC. Um, reauthorizations of the COVID Minnesota fund, anything exceeding a million dollars would have gone to the LCRC. 
Thank you. Representative Peterson. Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. That's it. Okay. Members, do we have any other questions? No further questions. All right, so um, in that case, I wanna thank the commissioner and staff from MMB uh, for their time today. I wanna thank um, members, right, for your participation uh, of the one of the first mini hearings of the Ways and Means Committee. Um, Gosh, I am, you know, I really expected more questions. So I'm, I'm a little back about this. But I, I do, before we just close out, um, I, I would just like to say again that, you know, as we uh, figure out this virtual type of public hearing, that one of the things, um, you know, with so much that happened in 2020, all the bad things that we can look at and reflect and think about, wow, you know, um, how we wish it could have been so much better and so different. One of the things that has happened is that we are having these virtual meetings. And because of that, it is really is an opportunity for the public to get to engage with us in a way that I think they would not have been able to had we not been, um, participating in this Zoom process. So I, I do want to encourage us as members as much as possible that if you can make, you know, either, uh, I, I think visuals are important. And so as much as possible, if you can make yourself available to be present on screen, that would be great. Uh, the second most viable option is that if you can have a photo of yourself so that people can also see you um, I, I just think that is important for really trying to be as effective and transparent as we can as, as a body. Um, and also, you know, as we look at the, the makeup of this body with many first and second term and some third term folks on Ways and Means, you know, this is my first uh, term on Ways, and, in, uh, on Ways and Means Committee, and I am the chair of Ways and Means Committee. Um, but I think that we all bring so much experience and expertise to this committee that, that will move our state forward in a positive way. And we have some of the best staff who have so a uh, wealth of experience and expertise and knowledge to share with us. So I'm hoping that we are all are open to um, listening, learning, asking questions, and know that there are folks here who are on staff who have that experience and expertise in a way that we don't. And so let's utilize all of that expertise that we have uh, from staff, but also from each other. So with that, we would not be meeting next week as we celebrate Martin Luther King Day. We will reconvene the following Monday on January the 25th. And the current plan is to use that time to review the report and recommendations that came from the Select Committee on Racial Justice. And with that, I don't have a gavel, but with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all. Thank you.